Halsey Powell remained in Ulithi for the remainder of January 1945. After a week and a half of R&R, &R, it was time to brush off the dust and get back to work. Monday, 5 February, Halsey Powell proceeded through the Magai Channel and spent two days at sea training. On Saturday, 10 February, Desron 53 was assigned to Task Force 58.2 that was forming up outside the atoll. In reality, nothing changed for the ship or crew. Task Force 38 and 58 were one and the same. The difference was, when the force was under Admiral Halsey, it was called the Third Fleet, codenamed Task Force 38. When under Admiral Spruance, it was the Fifth Fleet, codenamed Task Force 58. It was the same fleet, just different designations depending on who was in command. And today it was Admiral Spruance. Task Group 58.2 formed up around the fleet carriers USS Lexington, Hancock, and Enterprise, plus the light carrier San Jacinto. Once assembled, the group sailed northwest. Destination, the waters east of Tokyo, Japan. While en route, two squadrons of destroyers were formed into Task Group 58.8, which included the Halsey Powell. Their job was to form a forward scouting line that would operate some 40 miles ahead of the main group. The destroyers were paired with each pair spaced 10 miles from the next forming a 100-mile-wide vanguard ahead of the fleet for the run-in toward Japan that would extend the eyes and ears of the American fleet. This is when Desron 53 became known as the Tomcat Squadron. They went out to prowl around in the darkness to see what they could find like a Tomcat. In the pre-dawn hours of Friday, 16 February, 1945, the Halsey Powell and 15 other Fletchers left the main group, formed the advanced scouting line, and began to sail out in front of the fleet. The crew knew they would be closer to Japan than any of the other ships in the fleet. The weather was cold and cloudy with a ceiling around 500 feet. Poor, but not poor enough to scrub air ops. At 0600, the carriers began launching their air groups to attack positions in and around Tokyo. The crew of DD-686 got the feeling a huge hornet's nest was about to be hit with a big stick as they watched the first group of F-6F Hellcats fly toward Tokyo. They were attacking the nation's very capital, and they knew when the hornets came flying out the destroyers would be the first ones they would see. Surprisingly, radar remained free of enemy aircraft. In fact, the few threats posed by Japanese aircraft that day were dispatched by the group's CAP aircraft. Then, at 1645, a Japanese Zeke closed in on the port beam of the Halsey Powell. The fire director locked onto the incoming aircraft and all five of the ship's five-inch guns match pointers and roar to life. The 55-pound anti-aircraft shells, designed to burst when they neared an aircraft, began to explode in front of the Zeke, showering it with shards of iron splinters. The aircraft veered to its left and dropped its bomb harmlessly 500 yards off the port beam. The F-6F Hellcats of the cab finished the job, shooting the aircraft down into the sea. On the afternoon of Saturday, 17 February, Halsey Powell and the USS Cushing rejoined Task Group 58.2 and resumed normal screening and patrol duties. After sundown, the group moved southeast and away from Japan in the darkness. The crew could see muzzle flashes in the distance. It was the destroyer USS Mole over in Task Group 58.4 firing on enemy patrol boats. The group continued southward toward Iwo Jima. As the task group neared the operating area northwest of Iwo Jima in the early darkness of 19 February, 
The destroyer Yarnell reported a submarine contact at 0258. The group made an emergency turn and altered course to avoid the area. The Yarnell and the Wedderburn remained behind to pursue the contact. At 0905, the Halsey Powell and the rest of Destroyer Division 105 left formation and formed into an advanced scouting line ahead of the fleet. The carriers launched strikes against Japanese positions on the island throughout the day. That afternoon, lookouts spotted a mine floating nearby. The 20 and 40 millimeter gunners opened fire on the bobbing threat. Eventually, it simply sank without the big explosion that everybody had expected, making some of the crew think it may have been a loose sea buoy rather than a mine. When a group of oil drums floated nearby, the 20 millimeter gunners sank them as well. Enemy aircraft were observed approaching on radar several times over the day. However, none directly threatened Task Group 58.2. The group provided air support to the ground troops ashore on Iwo Jima from 20 February to 23 February before returning to attack Japan. On Saturday, 24 February, the group was again approaching Japan from the east. But high winds, snowstorms, and a heavy sea state hampered operations. Destroyer Division 105 was ordered to form up into Task Group 58.8, the advanced scouting line that would extend the eyes and ears of the task group for the run into Tokyo. Overnight into Sunday morning, 25 February, bad weather persisted. Snowstorms greatly hampered air operations. Only a few airstrikes were successfully launched on Tokyo before all flight ops were canceled that afternoon. The weather forecast was the same for the next day, so the group sailed west toward Nagoya. But the weather was no better and aircraft remained grounded. The group fueled on Tuesday, 27 February, then turned toward Ulithi entering the base on 01 March. The Halsey Powell spent the first two weeks of March moored in the Ulithi Atoll. The time was used to resupply, minor maintenance, training, and of course, R&R on Mogmog. Then it was back to Japan. On 14 March 1945, Halsey Powell and the rest of Desron 53 sailed out of Ulithi and joined with another 13 destroyers and formed up the group's screening unit. At the group center were the fleet carriers USS Franklin and Randolph. On Friday 16 March, the group rendezvoused with fuel units to make sure everyone was topped off before attacking Japan. On Saturday, 17 March, Destroyer Division 105 was again sent out to form an advanced scouting line to operate around 40 miles ahead of the main group. Before sunrise on Sunday morning, 18 March, enemy aircraft began to appear on the radar screens of the scouting line. The Japanese were aware the American forces were off their coast. A single enemy aircraft made a run on the Halsey Powell at dawn. Both the Halsey Powell and her partner, the USS Benham, trained their 5-inch guns on the inbound aircraft. When it closed to 7 miles, all 10 5-inch guns came to life. Shell explosions surrounded the aircraft. It veered, reversed course, and retreated. At dawn, Task Group 58 began to unleash airstrikes against targets on Kyushu Island. The crew of the Halsey Powell watched as waves of American bombers and fighters flew overhead toward Japan. At 0740, a Japanese Zeke was sighted, distance four miles. Gun directors swung around and tracked the incoming aircraft. The five-inch battery and the 40-millimeter mounts swung match pointers with the director and fired. Black puffs of smoke appeared all around the aircraft as shells exploded 
peppering it with iron shards. The Zeek turned and fled. Throughout the morning, enemy aircraft remained in the vicinity. However, no others came within firing range of Halsey Powell. At 1223, an F-6F Hellcat ditched 3,000 yards east of the ship. The Benham slowed and stopped to recover the pilot while DD-686 circled her. Just a few minutes later, another Hellcat ditched northeast of the Halsey Powell, distance 2,000 yards. Lieutenant R.H. Baldwin of the USS Blue Wood was brought aboard in good condition. At 1531, a Curtis Helldiver landed in the water 1,500 yards south of the ship. It took 10 minutes and the crew had Lieutenant Commander Phillips and his radio man S. Kajansky from the USS Wasp both on deck, happy to be out of the cold water. In addition to picket duty and rescuing downed airmen, Halsey Powell operated the YG homing beacon, a special radio beacon that provided returning strike aircraft navigation guidance that helped them locate their carriers. While it helped the American airmen, it also had a tendency to lead Japanese aircraft directly to the source of the signal. Just after midnight on 19 March, the crew could see Japanese flares in the sky around 12 miles north. They were looking for the American fleet. At 0039, radar notified CIC they were painting an enemy aircraft just four miles east of the ship. The radar fire director swung and tracked the attacker. The five inch battery matched pointers with the director and fired. Shells exploded downrange near the aircraft, sending the pilot fleeing. Later at 0213, surface radar reported a contact bearing 350 degrees, distance 13,500 yards. Halsey Powell made for the target and closed to 3,700 yards. The five inch guns opened up. Projectiles impacted close aboard the target, which faded then disappeared from radar pretty much confirming they were dealing with a submarine. 20 minutes later, sonar had a sound contact bearing 090 degrees, distance 2,700 yards. Halsey Powell and the USS Benham made for the contact and commenced a depth charge attack. The two destroyers looked for the sub for five hours but could not confirm a kill. Either it had slipped away or it was sunk. At dawn on Monday, 19 March, airstrikes continued on Shikoku and southern Honshu. Then at 0707, the USS Franklin reported being hit by two Japanese bombs. The carrier was in the middle of launching her second wave of aircraft and had 31 fully fueled and armed aircraft on her flight deck when the bomb struck. The ship erupted in flames. Below in the hangar deck, there were more aircraft that contributed to the flames. Soon, ordnance began to explode. The ship was being torn apart from within. The crew worked frantically to save their home. It took 12 hours, but eventually they got the conflagration under control and finally extinguished. The ship was out of the fight and more than 800 of her crew were gone. At 0745, the Halsey Powell and the rest of the destroyers out in the forward picket line were ordered to return to the main group that was already moving away from Japan. Ahead in the distance, the USS Franklin could be seen obviously in trouble. A thick black column of smoke spiraled into the air above her. Halsey Powell would spend 10 hours trying to catch up with the task group that was now sailing away from Japan. The Japanese attacked the destroyers as they worked to rejoin the main group and brought up the rear guard. It started at 0757 for the Halsey Powell. An enemy aircraft approached her port bow. Both the 5 inch battery and 40 millimeter guns opened fire. When flak began exploding around the airplane, the 
turned and left the area. Again at 0906, they opened fire on an approaching aircraft. When peppered with shrapnel, it too fled. Radar continually painted enemy aircraft in the area as DD-686 sailed toward the retiring task group. At 1300 that afternoon, the 5-inch battery roared to life, firing at a single enemy aircraft until it finally flew out of range. By 1730, the destroyers were back among Task Group 58.2 that was now steaming northeast. During the night, the task group protected the badly damaged USS Franklin from further attack. On Tuesday, 20 March 1945, the plan was for the destroyers to top off their fuel tanks from the heavies in the group. The first relay of fueling was scrubbed as enemy airplanes operated nearby. By noon, the air threat had diminished enough that it was deemed safe to begin fueling operations. The Halsey Powell was ordered to go along the starboard side of the USS Hancock to fuel. By 1403, she had matched course and speed with the big carrier. The crews rigged fueling lines and fuel oil began flowing. The time was also used to pass photographs and mail over to the Hancock and a breeches buoy was rigged to transfer three airmen over to the carrier. By 1448, Lieutenant Commander R.W. Phillips and Lieutenant R.H. Baldwin were feet dry aboard Hancock. The crew prepared Radio Man S. Kajanski for his transfer. Just as Kajanski began moving, the Hancock's general quarters Claxton rang out and enemy aircraft have been spotted at high altitude just three miles on the Hancock's port beam. The radio man was immediately pulled back aboard the Halsey Powell. The crew let go or cut all lines between the two vessels. Up on the Hancock's flight deck, their anti-aircraft batteries had opened up as the Zeke began its dive. On Halsey Powell's bridge, the skipper ordered the head flank right full rudder to pull clear the big carrier. The helmsman spun the wheel hard right, and both handles on the engine telegraph were pushed full forward. Down in the engine rooms, the boys on the throttle board stepped on the gas. Steam poured into the high pressure turbines. As 60,000 horsepower was sent down the propeller shafts, the familiar hum of the ship's machinery began to rumble below their feet. The ship's two 12-foot screws fit deep into the water and began pushing forward. As she began to move ahead, her bow swung right. When the skipper felt his ship would steer clear of the Hancock, he ordered the helmsman to meet her, which told the helmsman to stop the turn and steady up on a straight course. He swung the rudder to 15 degrees left to quickly arrest the ship's right turn. Above on Hancock's deck, the gunners were taking their toll on the diving Zeke. The aircraft was beginning to disintegrate as it dove through the withering barrage of fire. It broke apart about 1,000 feet above the flight deck. The bulk of the airplane, including the engine and large remnants of the plane's burning wings and fuselage, skimmed past the flight deck and disappeared over the starboard side, down where the destroyer was just beginning to pull away from the huge carrier. The flaming wreckage slammed into Halsey Powell's fantail just aft of the number five gun mount with a tremendous impact that shook the entire vessel. Up in the pilot house, they knew their ship had suffered a casualty of some kind, but did not yet know exactly what. Just as the ship's bow was about to transition from a right turn to a left, the helmsman spun the wheel back right to center the rudder and steady up on course. As he did so, Captain Merrill commanded all stop so they could begin to assess the cause of the huge impact and the bad vibrations that were now being felt throughout the vessel. The helmsman immediately knew something was wrong. The ship continued to swing into a left turn. The rudder indicator was frozen at 50 degrees left and was not responding to the wheel. The ship was now turning across Hancock's path. The helmsman frantically called out, letting the skipper know the rudder was not responding. 
Meanwhile, the ship was slowing, coasting directly in front of the approaching 27,000-ton aircraft carrier, which was accelerating when she went to a head flank when the attack started. It was obvious a collision was going to occur if something didn't change. Commander Merrill called out, port full ahead, starboard full back, hoping to stop the turn. Halsey Powell was now directly ahead of the Hancock, and a collision adjacent the number three gun mount seemed imminent. Sizing the situation up in an instant, Merrill commanded, all ahead full, then grabbed the TBS mic and shouted, this is hijacker, I've been hit, rudder jammed, unable to steer. Up on the bridge of the Hancock, they could see the Halsey Powell veering left across their path, disappearing below their bow. Hearing the call from hijacker, they immediately went to emergency back, all engines. The carrier slowed just as DD-686 surged forward in a wide sweeping left turn, clearing the Hancock's path and narrowly avoiding the collision. Once safely clear of Hancock, the crew began to assess. The immediate danger was gone. The concern now was the fire that burned on the main deck all around the number five gun mount. Fortunately, the fire was quickly extinguished, mostly by seawater, as the fantail was now so low in the water, it was a wash. Several of the ship's crew lay dead or dying around the wreckage on the fantail. The ship was unable to steer in anything but a circle, making it impossible to remain with the task group. Captain Merrill called all stop to assess damage. Large holes had been torn in the main deck above the aft crew berthing compartment. The airplane's bomb had passed through the starboard side of the hull leaving the compartment open to the sea. The destroyer Stephen Potter circled as the crew of DD-686 took stock, while the rest of the task force grew smaller and smaller as they continued on course. The Halsey Powell was down by the stern with flooding in her aft compartments. She had a hole in the bottom of the ship and was listing 10 degrees starboard. The rudder jammed at 15 degrees left. In addition to the damage caused by the plane, several 40 millimeter projectiles had impacted the starboard side of the vessel just aft of the torpedo mounts. Friendly fire that came from other ships that were also shooting at the Z. The task force was gone now over the horizon. It was now just the two destroyers all alone in a vast sea. From fire controlman second class, Jim Little. The captain of the number five gun mount was gunner's mate third class, Joe Capezio. He was attempting to get into the gun house when the wing of the airplane crashed down across the hatch he was entering. It severed his leg at the hip. The massive injury took my friend's life a few hours later. USS The Sullivans relieved the Stephen Potter as the task group moved south, leaving the two destroyers behind. Crew members that weren't on damage control or attending to the wounded got the grim task of attending to their dead shipmates. Remains were moved to the deck outside the ward room to be identified. A list of casualties would need to be tabulated and the remains properly attended to. The ward room was used as an impromptu emergency room where the wounded were treated. A list of casualties had been made. Robert Bovey, Joseph Campazio, Melvin Ignatovig, Rex Steffen, and William Sparks all died when the Zeke crashed into the fantail. Charles Hildorfer, Donald Roeder, and Leon Mazenik died when 40 millimeter rounds impacted the starboard side of the ship. Charles Perone, Joseph Denon, Harold Butler Sr., and John Winkler were missing. In addition to the 12 that were dead or missing, another 29 of her crew were injured, many with burns. The Sullivans sent over her medical officer, a pharmacist mate, and medical supplies to assist with the wounded. They also sent over a handy billy, a gasoline-powered pump to help counter-flood the ship. 
Damage control reduced the list to five degrees, but the ship was substantially down by the stern with waves now washing over the fantail. Experimenting with different propeller RPMs, they stopped the ship from sailing in circles and were able to make it go in one general direction. Using engines to steer, Halsey Powell took up a 150 degree heading as best as they could. The two destroyers began a slow retreat from the area. Enemy planes were continuously observed on radar. They remained out of gun range until 1610. Then a single plane headed for the Sullivans. Both ships opened fire with their 5 inch, 40 millimeter and 20 millimeter batteries. The Oscar flew mere feet above the mast of the Sullivans, continued westward and escaped. The Japanese pilot missed his opportunity to crash into the ship. Why? Maybe he was wounded by flak splinters, or maybe he lost his nerve. No one will ever know for sure. At 1632, another airplane began an attack run, bearing 350, distance 8 miles. The Sullivans opened with their 5-inch battery. Flak began to explode around the plane. It turned away and left the area. The two destroyers were subject to continued snooping and intermittent attack during daylight as they slowly made their way southeast. Cap aircraft soon arrived overhead to provide additional protection and aggressively attacked enemy aircraft. Several hours after the crash, Halsey Powell was making a rough course of 150 degrees with a speed of five knots steering by engines. Damage control work had progressed, but attempts to pump out the steering gear compartment proved impossible. Admiral Mitcher initially ordered the crew removed from DD-686 and the vessel sunk, but subordinate officers convinced the Admiral to allow the crew a chance to save their ship. In 1823, Halsey Powell received a TBS message directing the two destroyers to join the Franklin Group if possible. Throughout the night, the task force operated night fighters overhead, attacking any Japanese snoopers that ventured out looking for the American fleet or stragglers like the Halsey Powell and the Sullivans. The crew got a great deal of satisfaction when they saw night fighters dispatch an enemy aircraft. They watched the plane burst into flames, arc across the sky like a shooting star, and crash into the sea. In 0212 on 21 March, an enemy plane was seen on radar, closing from a distance of 3,000 yards. The skipper elected not to fire so as not to reveal their position. The plane passed directly over the Sullivans. Apparently never seen either vessel, it simply continued on its course. Unable to join the Franklin group, the two destroyers were ordered to proceed to Ulithi. At sunup, the welcome sight of cap aircraft arriving overhead provided some comfort to the two ships as they slowly proceeded southeast. Between Lieutenant Badgett and Sterling Tompkins, they were able to cut the hydraulic lines leading to the steering gear, allowing the rudder to swing free. Experimenting with different engine combinations, they got the rudder close to center, making it much easier to maintain course. At 10.42, an enemy Francis was spotted on radar, bearing 340 degrees, range 15 miles, heading for the Halsey Powell's port quarter. Cap was vectored to engage, but were unable to spot the attacker. Halsey Powell maneuvered the best she could, altering course 40 degrees right. The gun director swung around and locked on to the attacker. Gunners opened fire when the Francis closed to 8,000 yards. When shells began to explode around the plane, it changed course and paralleled the ship. 40 millimeter gun crews opened up, scoring hits on the fuselage, but the plane continued. As it passed a beam about 3,000 yards, the port side 20 millimeter guns let them have it. The bomber banked ever so slightly as if he was going to turn toward the ship. The crew prepared for another suicide crash. 
but the wings leveled, and the plane flew off in a straight line 50 feet above the water, gradually losing altitude. As cap fighters moved in to shoot the retreating aircraft from the sky, the Francis simply flew into the sea. At 12.50, another Francis was shot down, this one by Cap. Later, the Sullivans vectored Cap to another inbound threat, which they also splashed. At 15.43, another attacker was spotted on radar, bearing 110 degrees, range 15 miles. Alzi Powell CIC vectored Cap aircraft to intercept. That plane escaped northeast without even attempting a run on the two destroyers. At dusk, CAP aircraft returned to their carriers for the day, leaving the skies overhead unprotected. The crews of the two destroyers were getting a little worried. Just how many times could they endure these attacks before their luck ran out? On Thursday, 22 March, the Halsey Powell still in the company of the Sullivans, continued toward Ulithi. She maintained a sort of zigzag course using her engines to steer. This was also the day the crew would say their final farewells and honor their fallen shipmates. The remains of eight crewmen had been wrapped in weighted white shrouds. That afternoon, they were brought to the port side of the main deck. Each was draped with an American flag, a platform was rigged on the railing, and one at a time, each was placed atop the platform. Captain Merrill presided over the ceremony and recited a prayer for each. A crewman on each side held the flag, raised the platform, and one by one, the dead were consigned to the deep. The weather remained good for the journey to Ulithi and the threat of enemy aircraft attack had faded with each mile they had put behind them. On the morning of Sunday, 25 March, the duo arrived at the base in Ulithi. By 1100, Halsey Powell was moored alongside the destroyer tender USS Yosemite. Repair crews moved the ship into an auxiliary repair dock, basically a floating dry dock. Once out of the water, another missing crew member was discovered. It was Charles Perron, a ship fitter third class, found in the flooded carpenter's shop. His remains were removed and attended to, and he was buried on Ulithi. Temporary repairs began, but the vessel would need to return to the States. Crews needed to do just enough to make the ship safe for the voyage. It would take a month to make the hull watertight and structurally sound. While the repairs were going on, the crew did their best to put the entire ordeal behind them, spending time unwinding at the R&R &R facilities on the island of Mogmog. It was during this time in Ulithi, the ship's crew got the news that President Roosevelt died on 12 April 1945. Vice President Truman was now the President of the United States and the Commander-in-Chief of all U.S. military forces.